What I'd like to do now is to introduce uh, Rear Admiral John Meyer. He is PERS-4, the head officer and enlisted detailer. So turn it over to Admiral Meyer. Wow, that's a little surprising. I rarely get applause uh, when I come to places. So uh, thanks for the warm welcome. Uh, it's great to be back in Yakuska. I'm a former FDNF sailor, and I am personally very, very attached to the mission over here. I was stationed up in Atsugi years ago and loved my time here in Japan. Just the, the op tempo, the, uh, the purpose of our mission, uh, I really found that uh, impressive. Uh, Lynn Simpson uh, at Pack Fleet, I want to thank you really for pressing to put this together and CNP for funding it. And uh, there's a ton of our, my team that's here, uh, 20 plus detailers plus a whole contingent of other folks uh, that are here. Um, I hope you enjoyed Arthur's conversation. I really enjoyed that. I got to see that a long time ago. And um, you know, I stayed in the Navy to affect change and to make a difference is really what has driven me. And I think I find myself at a, at a great confluence in the Navy where both CNO and CNP are driving us to change and fix our personnel system, really the whole mpt and &E. I think uh, all of us would agree you've probably never seen so much change and so much drive to fix and improve things uh, as we have seen in probably the last two years. So without, without further ado, I'll just uh, start going through some slides. Please, just as ROE, if you got a question, please stand up and, you know, don't wait for the brief to be done. If there's a question you got on a slide, come on up to a microphone. You will not uh, interrupt my flow since I don't really have a flow. Next slide, please. Yes, sir. Okay, I will try to speak into the microphone. Uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. Next slide, please. So our mission, fundamentally our mission is that of uh, an arbiter between our two customers. Our customers being commands um, and sailors, right? Sailors have desires, needs, places they want to go, things that they want to do, that sort of thing. Uh, sailor choice. And then commands have a need and a requirement to fill particular billets. And then we are kind of in the middle, ultimately making that decision. Do you think one of those takes preference over the others? Did I hear some sailors? I heard some commands, maybe. Well, I was a former placement officer. So placement officers represent commands, which is really all about readiness. And I view our, our mission as readiness providers. For the personnel side of uh, the organization, I think all of us would agree that people are far and away our most precious asset, our most important asset. And if you don't have the right people, the right qualified people, it's pretty hard to do the mission. We try very, very hard to balance those two, but I would tell you, ties go to the command, all right? I mean, that's just the nature of our business is ultimately we're about readiness. If I can meet every, every sailor's choice and meet readiness, that's perfect, okay? Next slide. The challenges with that, and this, this slide kind of tells graphically probably my biggest challenge, okay? So what I've got depicted up there in the big pie in the left is what we would refer to as distributable inventory. Notice uh, the top bullet there, 14% of the force of our roughly 300,000 enlisted uh, service is either a student in some sort of training working their way to the fleet, that includes boot camp, or what we call TPPH, which is transients, transient patients, parolees, and holdies, or something like that. Basically, it's, it's friction. It's, it's sailors that are uh, unable to be distributed because they're either getting trained or, or essentially uh, in transit to, the, to their job, okay? Where this also gets sticky are those two big arrows that I have there, limitations and considerations. Considerations are just that. Those are special considerations that our detailers give to our sailors, a whole host of things, largely policies that we've put in place in the Navy to help sailor choice, to help quality of life, and do everything we can to retain our best and brightest. Some examples of that. Uh, dual military service members, COLOs, okay? Detailers would tell you that that's a little bit on the difficult side. 
but it is absolutely in our best interest to try to keep families together. And if we can, more often than not, and I would say by more often than not, I would say over 90% of the time, we are able to get sailors together. It's very rare that that does not happen. Another example of a consideration is exceptional family members. Exceptional family members, through some unique health circumstance of dependence, uh, they may have constraints on where they can travel. They might need to be near special medical facilities. And uh, we bend over backwards to help sailors in that regard as well. Limitations are just that. Those are, are more restrictive. So limitations means I really can't utilize those sailors. And that the two largest categories of that would be our limited duty folks. We need to be an organization where people get hurt, where they get sick, where they go off of that operational duty and they get healthy, uh, get fixed, and then we bring them right back into the mix. And then the other is pregnancies from sea duty as well. And again, we've got to be an organization where female sailors can have kids go off of operational sea duty. Uh, when they're physically ready, they can come back to uh, operational duty. Those are kind of uh, the, the really where the friction comes into play. That blue piece of the pie is not as big as the billet base that we have in the Navy. And that's ultimately my challenge. So when we talk about shortages in distributable inventory, I don't have enough people to fill all the jobs that we have in the fleet. Okay? Next slide. This graph here is a little bit of a different depiction than what CNP showed on uh, his opening graph. It shows percentages of fit and fill. Uh, by the time we're done here, I expect that we'll all be manning and manpower experts, so we understand the difference between fit and fill. Fill is purely numbers of people. I think I've got 12 seats here, and it looks like I've got about nine, eight people, some eight of 12 in the front row here in terms of fill, okay? That's just bodies in the command. It has nothing to do with what's on their collar device. It has nothing to do with what their NECs are. Fit starts to look into that. Fit is the way we do it. Uh, this, this metric, devised by Fleet Forces Command, is a metric that gauges rating fit. Notice I did not say NEC fit. We do capture that. We do measure that. We're very concerned about NECs, but the two things that I'm looking at right here are numbers of bodies in a command and pay band or pay grade fit, okay? You can see we're on the decline. Right now, I've got roughly 8,000 gaps at sea. The slide that CNP showed you, that's going to decrease over the next year, year and a half before we start to bottom out. The reasons for that, CNP touched on a lot of them, but the biggest reasons that we have is we overassess. We brought in a whole lot of people in FY12 and 13. What are those people doing right now? They're either getting out or they're rolling to shore duty, one or the other. Roughly 50% of our accession sailors, our first tour sailors, decide to get out of the Navy. Thank you very much for your service, but roughly half of them, that's relatively consistent, uh, get out at that first opportunity. So that's one issue, is that 12 and 13 cohort, and one that really hurt us. At the end of FY16, we were running out of money and we cut off the spigot. We turned off the accessions and saved money, but basically shorted ourselves 2,000 sailors almost immediately. Those are really the largest uh, factors that are driving things right now. I tell you that because it's very important to understand it is very easy to negatively impact Manning. If, if the Navy wanted to, they could turn off the accession pipeline right now, save a lot of money, but they would stop the inflow of sailors, and then we would deal with it. You, see, you, can, you can turn it off quick. Turning it on is really, really hard. It takes a long time, and generally, if I make a decision today, that's going to be part of the FY19 or FY20 budget. That means sailors will be coming in maybe in 20 or 21, a year to train them, maybe some longer training them. You can see how long that will take from a decision today to start funding accessions, how long it will take to get those people in the Navy. Okay? Next slide. 
Now, this is where I'm really going to make you manpower experts. So there's an organization that works for CNP called NAVMAC. If, some of you are probably familiar with it. But in order to figure out how many people you have to have in a command, NAVMAC does this. They send their experts to a command, and they do analysis in your unit. They uh, don't do it to every destroyer, for example, but they'll do it to destroyers. They'll do it to Nimitz class carriers, and they did a whole bunch of this in the Ford class carrier, where I was uh, a little while ago. And they determine the volume of work. So I got X number of hours of all this stuff that we got to do over the course of a year, and there are a course of a, a week, say, and they divide that by the number of hours in the average work week equals a number of sailors. And let's say that number of sailors is 100, okay? So if they do their math and they figure that the, the workforce requirement is 100 people, now that gets turned over to the people that buy the manpower, okay? And there's a big difference between manning and manpower, which most people do not understand, okay? Manpower is the seats that you see in the front row here, or the seats in the auditorium. Somebody paid for this seat. The manning is the people that are actually in the seats. It's a simple way of looking at it, okay? So this fictional unit that we got 100 uh, units or 100 people's worth of work now gets turned over to the people that buy the seats. If you're in the surface community, they buy about 99% of what NAVMAC says the requirement is. The submarine force buys 100% of it, and aviation buys about 80% of it. So aviation says, we're going to only buy 80 of those seats, and that means that the BA for that unit is 80. Okay? That's how that works. So if you see the two middle columns, funding and billets authorized, those are generally the same, but that's really where you get the, uh, the definition of BA. BA is a function of NAVMAC defined workload equals numbers of bodies and what people are going to buy in terms of what we can afford. Now, if BA is not uh, aligned perfectly with what the workforce or what the workload is, there are certainly good reasons for that, okay? And those reasons have, are, well, a long time ago, before I went to my first command, I was told by a, uh, a wise advisor that you'll never have enough money, you'll never have enough people, and you'll never have enough parts. And if you go into command, if you go into leadership with that notion, the Navy's going to give you what the Navy can afford to give you on that path. And then leaders take that and they turn that into operational and warfighting readiness. I mean, if you think about it, you're never going to have all the people you need or want. You're never going to be in an environment where anything that breaks on your ship or your aircraft, you immediately have something off the shelf, right? We wouldn't have any CAS reps if that was the case, right? You just pull it off, plug it in, and you'd go. Um, the inventory is a lot less than that. Why is the inventory less? Because of friction. Friction is that TPPH, that student IA, it is the limited duties, it's the pregnancy from C. All of that is not fully funded. So if NAVMAC determined you needed 100 people for this command, aviation only bought 80 billets, and there's, so they buy 80 seats, BA is 80, about 15% of that is going to be friction. So if you do the math, I think that's about 12. That's what your distributable inventory is going to be. 80 minus 12, which is math in public, 62, 68 rather. So 68 people to fill 80 slots. How in the world do you do that? By prioritization. Across the Air Force, that means the folks that are back in the maintenance phase not doing stuff go even lower than 68 so that we can slosh the manning to those units that are going to be operational. That's kind of a layman's term for exactly what we're doing on a day-in, day-out basis. So we talk about prioritization, uh, whether it's OFRP or whether it's FDNF. They're manned at the highest levels, and actually FDNF would be manned uh, at the higher of the two. 92% uh, fit, 95% fill is the threshold for that, okay? Next slide. There have been a ton of initiatives. CNP talked about a lot of them, and uh, just you know, uh, to put this in perspective, 
He's generally going to talk about much more of a strategic vision for where we're going with MPT&E. I live kind of in the tactical world. Uh, my team's writing a lot of these uh, proposals, sending them up. We're canvassing the fleet. We're getting ideas from either internally or externally on ways that we can improve things. Uh, the extension of enlistments to PST, uh, that one actually was canceled by another one. Uh, higher tenure modifications are listed up there. Uh, E7 through E9 assignments to C chief petty officers to see. Uh, happy to talk about that in greater detail if anybody needs to. Uh, the changes to the CMSID cycle, we changed that not too terribly long ago. We're coming up on our second cycle of that. To put a little perspective on why we did that, we figured out that with our marketplace the way it is, we didn't have a whole lot of rollers to the jobs that we were going. And by going to a two-month cycle, we doubled the number of rollers. We also doubled the number of jobs. Mathematically, that gives you much, much more sailor choice, a much greater opportunity to improve fit in commands, and it provided the added benefit of slowing down the process a little bit so that mid-cycle, when we're not competing for jobs or advertising jobs, all the key stakeholders are utilizing that time for coordinating, for realignments, for making sure people are uh, going in the right places and slowing down the process such that we can work some of these initiatives that we're talking about. Uh, the voluntary sea duty program, next one. And then the next slide is gonna talk about uh, the early separation uh, stuff that all got canceled. The physical readiness you know about, but I want to drop anchor on EOS to PRD alignment. Got a question? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Crisis. Um, so the, the last one here is what canceled that first NAV admin. This is EOS to PRD alignment. So that whole discussion about how we fill billets, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail here, hinges upon what? I've got to have an accurate demand signal. My demand signal is based on what? Sailor's PRD. PRD is what signals into our systems, into CMSID, that sets the demand signal, I've got to fill this billet on this unit at this particular time. What if that PRD's wrong? Now my demand signal's wrong, and the whole process breaks down, which drives gaps to see, in particular, gaps to see in critical units like FDNF. Next slide. What I've got here in the next slide is a distribution. So if you see the, the kind of, it looks kind of like a bell curve distribution on the left, right? All those r numbers, which are reflective of numbers of sailors in different groupings, have a PRD beyond EOS, EAOS. And this is only first tour sailors. And I already told you that half of first tour sailors are going to separate, right? What that first slide shows you, or the first graph shows you, is roughly that volume of sailors has an inaccurate demand signal. So I think that the sailor's going to make it to that PRD, yet they elect to get out at their EOS, and now I have no ability inside the CMSID window to fill that gap. This is very, very important for this crowd in particular, and it goes to alignments and how we work to make sure that PRDs are accurate and alignments are accurate. So that whole nav admin is going to change to the future state where everybody either has a PRD at EOS, EAOS, or a PRD before EAOS, which is fine from my perspective because I know that they'll make it to the PRD. Okay? Next slide. This is a, a graphical example of uh, some of the incentives that we're putting in place for FDNF, okay? We've been talking about this for a long time, about how to incentivize FDNF service, how to recognize it, and uh, what we're able to do. One of the things that came out of the uh, Secretary of the Navy's analysis and Fleet Force's analysis, and we understand this, is that uh, shorter tour lengths create more churn in a command. And without a doubt, if you're FDNF, your tour lengths, on average, in the aggregate for the units, are less than they are for CONUS units, okay? There are JTR constraints on tour lengths that do not exist for CONUS units. What does that mean? It means that you have more turnover, more training, uh, more flux, if you will, of your folks. 
And I can imagine uh, over here, there's a lot of instances where you get a sailor right to kind of that sweet spot where you need them to be in training because they're at about the three-year mark. They're probably as valuable as they're going to be. And then guess what? They got to transfer. That's not healthy for our Navy, and uh, we're working to fix that. So what I'm briefing you is proposed. I, I mean, it's not signed yet, so we've uh, put all the NAV admins up to CNP's office. He's got that. There's still some heavy lifting that needs to go on with uh, Secretary of the Navy and OSD about JTR tour links and that sort of thing. But what we're doing is we're trying, we are going to drive to 48-month tours for uh, FDNF, for the places that you drove. Uh, in the interim, so all the folks that are here right now, until we start to get this policy going, it is imperative to us that we do everything that we can to bridge that gap and incentivize sailors to stay longer for all the reasons that I just mentioned. So what are we going to do with that? We've got OTIP. That still exists, and there's some great OTIP options out there that our sailors uh, take advantage of. What we're going to do in the bottom example is if a sailor extends out beyond 48 months, we're going to clip any remaining uh, sea time that's associated with that tour. That doesn't, that doesn't apply to everybody. I think it applies to 16 ratings, something like 16 of our uh, ratings. The example that I gave you on the bottom is an engineman, which has one of the longest uh, sea, prescribed sea tours that we have, a 60-month prescribed sea tour. If we get that sailor to extend out to 48 months, at the end of that 48 months, they could owe tip more, longer if they wanted to, but uh, we'll send them back to shore duty, okay? The real deal, though, here, I think, is uh, the bullet about preferential detailing. And I'll go into that in a minute. If we get a sailor to voluntarily extend, take advantage of the O-tip, we'll, sh we'll cut short any remaining sea time, we'll also give them preferential detailing. Okay, so this is a non-monetary compensation initiative on our part. You know, usually we think of uh, and incentives for folks as being what? Just purely monetary, okay? This is non-monetary, and I'll explain how it works to you here in another slide. So next slide. This just talks about the OTIP options. I think those of you that have sailors that take OTIP know that most of them want to take the time off or the time and the ticket back home. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, this gives two examples, and this is a kind of important aspect for um, what we're talking about for sailors to extend. If you notice the bottom example there about how a sailor would be eligible to get the waived PSET and the preferential CMSID, a sailor has to make that choice before they enter the CMSID window. It's not because we're being mean or uh, don't want to help sailors, but if a sailor enters the CMSID window, they're negotiating for their next set of orders based on their PRD, right? If they're in that window, they may not like what they see and may elect to, hey, I want to OTIP. Well, we'll probably entertain that and, and adjust things, but we're probably also not going to be able to give them all the uh, incentive here that we're talking about. So this decision ha really has to be made beforehand, and it all goes to the accuracy of the demand signal that gets baked into the system, okay? Next slide. So this is the CMSID screen that our detailers get to look at, okay? It's kind of an eye chart, so you may not be able to see, but in this instance, we've got five sailors that have applied through CMSID, okay? And just, you know, just to be clear, CMSID is a marketplace, okay? It's a, mar it's a very crude marketplace uh, type of assignment system. It's constrained by the IT that we had at the time that it was built. It's also extremely constrained by the fact that I've got way more jobs to advertise and I've got people to fill the jobs. In order to have a really good marketplace, it's got to be thick, uncongested, and fair. We aren't very thick. Congestion and it is fair, believe it or not, and I'll explain how that works here in a second, okay? So, so this slide shows what a detailer is looking at. So in this instance, we're advertising a job in Rota, and that's assigned in the bottom. If you can read that, it's a Rota billet. It's the same job. You've got five applicants. Some little uh, chicklets come up there, uh, stoplights basically, to tell you how the sailor looks for it. In the instance for this, hey, we've got a sailor that's off of Reagan that wants this job. 
our detailers are going to go in and they're going to look at, did that sailor OTIP to 48 months or longer? And if they did, that sailor is going to get the preferential selection. That sailor will get selected. Okay? I will tell you, I, I think this is a huge step in the right direction to incentivize sailors to, to OTIP. Um, going from Yakuska to Rhoda, I mean, Rhoda's probably the hottest ticket in the Navy right now. We have absolutely no problem filling those billets. Folks want to stay there tremendously. Um, in this case, uh, the sailor will get that job. Okay? Next slide. So this is the um, kind of the cycle of life, if you will, for how the detailing priority requisition process starts. If you look in the far right corner, you'll see where it says MCA. MCA is the Manning Control Authority Fleet. There's also Manning Control Authority Bureau. Okay, Manning Control Authority Bureau owns about, that's essentially me, own about half of the shore duty billets. Manning Control Authority Fleet owns the other half of the shore duty billets, things like ATG and FRSs and that sort of thing, and all of the sea duty billets, okay? So those two Manning Control Authorities have a list of priorities. They also have information that we determine, which is what we call the roller pool. So if the PRDs are accurate, I know all the folks that are going to be rolling at a certain time in the Navy, okay? I also have 8,000 gapped billets in the fleet today, all right? So I have 8,000 gapped billets, and we'll say for the sake of argument, I've got 5,000 sailors that are in the roller pool, okay? So 5,000 sailors to compete now for 13,000 jobs. How in the world do you do that? Well, the Manning Control Authority goes down a list and essentially racks and stacks those billets by priority. And it gets pretty complicated when we're talking, obviously, not all sailors are interchangeable parts. If you've got an AD-1 or an MM-2 or what have you, they don't all fit in interchangeable parts. So those priorities get based upon the roller pool. And then ultimately, when all of that is done, there is a, a TICOM input, there's a fleet input, commands get a, uh, an input th through their TICOMs to determine those priorities. Uh, all of that then gets entered into CMSID, and that's what gets advertised and shown to our sailors that go and look for jobs in the fleet, okay? The sailors, uh, the times are up there, but once it's in CMSID, there's a, a time period of about a week for sailors to make their applications. Command career counselors and commands and supervisors should be assisting, helping, aiding our sailors in making those choices and encouraging them to stay in the Navy. Um, that gets a, an opportunity where the command in BBD, which is really just CMSID, it's a subroutine in there, uh, but commands get an opportunity to vote, to rank their folks. I don't know how many of you all know that, but uh, it doesn't seem that a lot of people do because not a lot of people vote, which tells us that you just don't really care, just fill my billet. I'm kind of agnostic as to who it is, just fill my billet. And, and if that's truly the case, that's fine. Um, and then ultimately the detailer makes the selection, okay? And that's where the detailer, you know, where it comes down to, the detailer is looking at that screen. In the instance that I showed you earlier, five sailors selected that one job. The detailer is going to make a determination for that, okay? Next slide. This is the detailing window. Um, this got backed up a little bit um, since we changed the CMSID window out to the longer two months. That meant that we backed up to 12 months uh, is when we start entering the CMSID window. Next slide. This is important stuff for this crowd, quite honestly. I mean, how do you help your sailors? How do you help your command get the manning that you need? Uh, engagement with your sailors, clear. Command career counselors, um, retention teams, uh, career development boards, all those things are absolutely vital. And I would tell you that the commands that engage the most, the most passionately in that, the leaders that engage the most in that, that spend the time and energy, because believe me, when you do this stuff, it is a huge, huge investment in time. But if you, like me, believe that people are our most precious asset, our most precious resource, that's, ex that's what you got to do. That is what leaders do. Um, now, if you're in a smaller command, 
I'm pretty sure that your command career counselor is a collateral duty. If you're in a destroyer or a squadron, anybody want to argue that with me? I think that that's the case. If you're in an aircraft carrier, you get kind of spoiled because you probably have a uh, NCCM on the carrier. You probably got a uh, career counseling team of about four or five folks, a master chief, a chief, and then all of your departments will have career counselors as well. So you get a really robust team, but you also got a huge number of folks that you got to work through this process. Uh, BBD alignments is enormously important. So if you've got a newly made second class petty officer who is sitting in a entry level or in a session job, an apprentice job, that sailor's out of alignment. And that's going to cause problems for the distribution signal. So when we're looking into our systems, if your sailors aren't in the right seats, that, that matters to us, okay? And that can impact whether or not your job ultimately gets advertised. And, and you know what you want from where you're sitting is you want your job to be prioritized such that it gets advertised, right? So if that's your goal, what I'm telling you here, I mean, this is kind of the code, the code, all right? Engage with your placement coordinators. Engage with your sailors. Do everything you can to keep your sailors in. Make sure that your billet data is all accurate information. Uh, anybody here know their placement coordinator? A few people? OK. Uh, if you don't know your placement coordinator and you're in that process, uh, you probably need to come talk to Al Ross, and we'll, we'll help you get in comms with your placement coordinator, all right? Enormously important that commands have that direct line of engagement with their placement coordinators. Uh, the more you understand about CMSID, the better. And uh, again, I'm a huge proponent of command career counselors. When I was on Ford, I had uh, Master Chief uh, Gene Garland was our command career counselor won the golden anchor, and he and I went out and paid in the anchor in the shipyard while we were still in dry dock, which was a, a lot of fun, uh, I will tell you. I, I still got a trash pair of coveralls with gold paint all over them. So uh, next slide. Future initiatives. There are a ton of future initiatives. The first one is something CNP touched on. I am doing everything I can to improve the customer experience for both of my customers for sailors and commands. So what are we doing for sailors? We instituted call monitoring. Some portion of every day I listen to a phone call or phone calls from our detailers. Not every detailer has a phone that can be monitored. This is kind of a crude system, but I now have that capability. We're turning on functional email accounts. So if you understand what functional email accounts are, right now if you want to email me, you have to know who I am, how to spell my name, Right? It's john.f.meyer at navy.mil. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just send an email to pers4 at navy.mil, whether I'm in the chair or whether my relief's in the chair or somebody else is in the chair? That is imminently going to be turned on for all of our detailers and all of our organization. I think that's a huge step in the right direction. And then the other thing that we're doing is surveys. Right now, uh, you can do an ICE survey. I think you all have ICE out here. Are you familiar with what ICE is? ICE is, in, in my opinion, it's kind of cumbersome. It's good if there's kind of a problem. You'll generally get a response to it, but it has no metrics associated. We just went online uh, just last week, right before we headed out here. We just went live with a new survey system that is uh, an optional system that is at the bottom of every email, at every detailer's email. You can go online and we can capture metrics that are actually definable metrics on a scale. Uh, if you need a callback or a contact information or anything like that, I welcome it, okay? Um, this is a big deal to us. We've never had any numeric or quantifiable metric for how we're doing. Quite frankly, the only metric I, I seem to get is the number one complaint that CNP fields and relays to me, which is, I can't get a hold of my detailer. <laughs> well, I'm, I might have made that a little bit harder when we changed the CMS ID window to the two-month cycle, right? Because now I've got twice the number of people trying to contact their limited number of detailers in the same amount of time. So I might have made that a little bit more difficult in the near term, but I'm here to tell you our detailers are committed, as committed as, as any group of folks I've ever seen, 
There's just a staggering volume at times coming into the detailers, okay? Our charges to get to folks, the red line is within 72 hours, the target is within 24 hours, okay? And that's a, that's a pretty high bar, uh, but that is what we are striving for, all right? Uh, so that's customer service, IT transformation, all of what we really want to do in the mpt and &E hinges on our, our ability to improve the information technology. That is starting right now with pay and personnel, and if you think about it, that's kind of ground zero, because if the pay and personnel system doesn't get modernized, it's kind of hard to do all the other stuff, because it's all woven together. So you got to get the pay stuff first, and that's already being done up at Great Lakes. Marketplace detailing is a fantastic initiative, and right now it's a concept, but we have a, a pilot in work where Bupers 3 is going to talk about marketplace detailing more. We are looking right now, actively looking for a rating, a single rating in the Navy, or maybe a couple of ratings, where we can demonstrate and pilot all of the concepts that we're talking about doing in marketplace detailing. Ideally, it would be much more interactive with sailors and detailers. There'd be much more um, online ability to advertise jobs and incentivize jobs. This is stitched in with tailored compensation, where in a perfect world, we would have a more agile and responsive way to, hey, I've got no interest in this, in anybody filling this seat right here. Well, what if I could dial in the next CMS ID window, $200 a month incentive to go to that job? and nobody has filled it the next month, what if I could dial it up a little bit more? Concepts like that. Um, the whole concept of fill to vacancy. This, this is born out of the fact that every year, what happens September 16th? Chiefs, right? We make roughly 4,000 new chiefs on September 16th. And then what do we do on September 17th? immediately start scrambling and trying to get all the chiefs that are not in the right seats into the right seats in the Navy. That is a big, big problem for us. If you're running a business, would you promote a whole bunch of people and then figure out where you're going to put them? No business in the world does that. We do that. We're going to demonstrate an ability with this field of vacancy to advertise jobs essentially the exact same way that the civilian sector does where you can either go laterally into that job, vertically into that job, or in an ideal situation, come in from the outside. And that would be really your reserve component coming in and taking that job. It's imperative that when somebody takes that job and, and both of these pilots, that it be done and demonstrated in essentially a contracted tour length model as well, um, which was a break from kind of how we do enlisted contracts right now, which are whole year contracts, not necessarily linked to a tour length. Uh, and so the, notice those things I just kind of talked about. All of that is kind of baked into, really, this marketplace detailing concept, where in a perfect world, I, if I have a 1,000 jobs that you're eligible for, I show you a 1,000 jobs. Some of those jobs I don't want you to go to. Many of those jobs I need you to go to. Now, how do I get you to take that choice and to actually make the decision? That's where we start talking about incentives, both monetary and non-monetary, OK? I want you to make the choice that the Navy needs. We're also looking at a way to optimize this, because every sailor that rolls to a new command or rolls out of a sea duty or out of a shore duty has a value to the organization, what I would tell you is an optimal readiness value to the Navy. I want you to go to where I get the, where we get the most readiness bang for the buck for you. And I should be willing to pay you and incentivize you to do that, okay? Those are the concepts that are underpinning this. And uh, you'll probably see something uh, hitting the street probably in the next few months on the advance to vacancy and a little bit longer on the marketplace detailing pilot. Next slide. I guess that was it. So what kind of questions you got for me? <coughs> I'll back away from the microphone if I'm scaring folks away. Here's a question in the back. Awesome. There's a switch on there if you just want to. 
Good morning, sir. Good morning. SCC Tyler coming from Diego Garcia. So the uh, timeline that you presented is good for three year tours, but Diego Garcia is a 12 month tour. So with the PRD or the orders negotiation window now, starting at the 12 month window, are there any plans for those tours or can uh, sailors either bundle orders, select orders to go to Diego Garcia or other 12 month tours and then select follow on orders before they go to those 12 month tours? That's a great question. A question that I did not think we would get because nobody in here in Yakuska is uh, on less than the 24 or 36 month orders. So we don't do the 12 month orders here. Diego does. We are talking about doing bundled orders. Right now our IT does not enable bundled orders, but what I can tell you is the timeline that I spelled out up there, that is for the bulk of the Navy. I would probably tell you that's 95% of the, the Navy falls in, if not more, falls into that uh, timeline. That small number of sailors that do have the 12 month tours, we are not gonna handcuff folks or do anything. That'll be much more personal uh, engagement with detailers on assignments. Um, I love the idea of bundled tours. What I'd really like you to do though is extend in Diego Garcia. You wanna, you wanna, <laughs> so you wanna, you wanna OTIP to Diego Garcia? Now you're talking my language and, and I'll tell you why. Um, the Navy, moves a hundred or does a hundred thousand PCS moves a year. A hundred thousand PCS moves a year. We spend roughly seven hundred million dollars with the six hundred or sixty thousand funded moves a year. Where do you think the most expensive moves in the Navy are? Here. Diego Garcia is an expensive move. Bahrain's crazy expensive. Anything in Europe CONUS is relatively inexpensive, so if we can do fewer moves in the Navy, as I like to tell CNP, and we're working with his staff on this, if I can save money in PCS moves, and we can find a creative way through the comptroller to pull some of that savings over to the tailored compensation and incentive pot of money, wow, now we can start getting some stuff done, right? But if I just save, if I just save 10% from our PCS budget, that's almost $400 million across the fiscal year defense plan. That is a staggering amount of money. Uh, and just a, a funny story since we're on the topic of PCS. Um, I met the HR lead for FedEx and I was talking to him. It was pretty neat. Uh, Carvin Brown, I think is his name. And, uh, I'm talking to him about the differences between our, our business models. And I'm talking to him about moving. And he, he's got this real thick southern drawl and he kind of pulls his glasses down when I tell him that we do, uh, you know, spend $700 million a year moving people. He puts his glasses down and his nose looks at me and he says to me, moving people's expensive. It's like a man of few words, but you know what? FedEx is running a business. They're not moving 60,000 people around a year. They're not spending $700 million of their shareholders' money moving their employees around. That really was a light that went off in my head because that kind of an approach to our Navy could save some substantial money that we could use perhaps in other places. So great question. And, uh, you know, we, we did have that exact same concern when we started looking at changing the window of how that might impact sailors. Even in the old window, um, you know, with a sailor with a 12-month tour, I mean, it was basically you show up and you kind of write into CMSID anyway, so. Admiral, we have a question from the internet we're bringing up on the screen. How can you make it easier for commanders to remove sailors that due to numerous reasons are not able to serve actively at their command? So I think that the question is talking about um, an initiative that we're working on, which is deployability. And it's talking about uh, a sailor who's frequently med down or sick or limited duty or not a fully functional sailor. Um, we are working initiatives with the Secretary of Defense to improve the deployability of the force across the board. Uh, my staff utilizes a code which is called a deployability category code, which determines whether or not a sailor can be assigned to particular uh, duties. 
I think the question, though, is more about a sailor that's inside a command. And if a sailor's inside a command and they're sick or they're not stepping up to the plate, I, there are always administrative ways or medical ways. If it's a medical issue, if it's repeated health issues, that sounds like a prime candidate for having that sailor evaluated for limited duty. Um, that sailor would go, then go limited duty. That would vacate the billet. The billet would then go into that pot of billets that would be prioritized and hopefully get advertised. If it was a critical billet in a command, uh, then it becomes a manning action from the TICOM to fill that as quickly as possible. So, yes. Good morning, sir. Senior Chief Pacetti from Desert 15. Uh, my question is about seashore rotation. So I'm currently on a 42-month seashore rotation, and this will be the second time in my career where I've I've cut short six months of what I owe the Navy because my first seashore was 50, 52, 54 months, and I did 48 months. Um, is the Navy looking to make it annual because enlisted orders are annual? And then if you come to Japan, you basically you do six months too little or six months too much. Um, there's no way for me to fill that seashore without OTEPing. Or if I go to another ship from here, I do four you know, 24 extra months. Yeah, I think if I understand your question correctly, Senior, I think you're talking about misalignment between your enlistment contract and your sea tour. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's an issue that we identified. Right now, the, the software and the system doesn't really allow us to do a monthly or a, a direct linkage of your uh, contracted reenlistment to your tour length. It's a whole year. I think it's called Prideway is, I believe, the name of the Pride Mod is the uh, software system that does that. That's one of the many archaic systems that we have that is on our list of things that we're going to improve, uh, that we're going to fix that. But I, ideally, what we want to do is maybe get you a little bit beyond the PST such that you know, we're not having to do that with you, OK? So yes? Good morning, Admiral. Uh, this is Lieutenant Martin. I'm the admin officer for uh, Fleet Activity Yokosuka. Sir, uh, one question or maybe a recommendation. Uh, for we, as an installation, we receive about 60, 70% of uh, limb do and pregnancy. And uh, one of the things that we've seen uh, for the past few years here is uh, our limb do and pregnancy, you know, TPHH, you mentioned it already. Uh, after they're clear for, to, uh, to, for assignments, uh, most of them are uh, getting sent back. So they're, they're staying here for their limb do pregnancy, and then they're, after they get clear for, for, for pregnancy and limb do, a lot of them is going back to, to US. I mean, that just last 20 transfers, PCS transfers that we did for limb do and pregnancies, uh, most of them went to, uh, to the States. Why not keep them here and uh, support our fleet here, sir? That's a great question. Without knowing the details, Al's taking notes on this, and we'll look into it. I think what you're dealing with there is if you look at um, when a, for, for example, when a female sailor uh, becomes pregnant and can no longer be on the operational unit, goes to the shore command, has her child, and then the postpartum time, all that basically is probably pushing them up to the, either the two-year unaccompanied or the three-year accompanied. And if they elect not to OTIP, then we would be sending them back to the states. I think that that's probably what the issue is. Uh, no, sir. The, a lot of them, like after they cleared the 12, the 12, you know, a lot of them is coming from the sea duty right. and come to us. And they stay here for 12 months for after they pregnant, so to, for their pregnancy tour, right? And a lot of them goes back to the states, which is like I'm going to mention about our own command or some other commands that we know that have a, you know, even just an LS3, a YN3 or something that there's a gap in there already. But we, we can't put them in there because this detailer sent them to like San Diego or Norfolk, sir. So. Yeah, I, I would tell you that I think every pregnancy is kind of a unique case that you know I've dealt with in command or I think that we deal with um, and there's a lot of sailor choice in there as well so if yeah. they're going to be coming off sea duty to have a child is is their family and support network network here in Yakuska or is it back in the states so uh, if I could talk to you afterwards maybe we'll tighten that up a little bit but if there's something that we're missing or something that we can do better in that regard um, I'm all ears for that 
Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Admiral, what I'd like to do is uh, move on to the rating modernization, but we'll Excellent. have the leadership panel where I'm sure we'll get more of these questions here shortly. Thank you very much for your time today.